Okay, we're ready to start. Thanks everyone for coming. This is our four o'clock press conference. Climate change has unexpected consequences for animal populations. Our panelists today are Ken Tape, Laura Pru, Scott LaPointe, and Darcy Gray. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ken. Thanks Lauren, thanks for uh, inviting me. I'm gonna talk briefly about beaver colonization of the Arctic uh, today. The co-lead on the project is Benjamin Jones uh, from the USGS Alaska Science Center. He's here as well. Uh, it's a collaborative project between the University of Alaska Fairbanks, USGS Alaska Science Center, and the Alfred Wegener, Wegener Institute uh, in Germany. We also have a poster uh, tomorrow that, that Ben Jones is a lead author on. This is a picture of a map of northern Alaska. You can see tree line there in orange. Beavers have historically been absent from the Arctic tundra. Using satellite imagery, we detected scores of new beaver dams. Let me see if I can get this pointer here. We detected scores of new beaver dams in this part of Alaska using time series imagery uh, from 1999 to 2014. So in essence, and we have similar observations from other parts of the Alaska tundra. In essence, beavers are moving from the boreal forest into the tundra environment and we're able to map this wildlife from space uh, using, looking at the appearance and disappearance of beaver ponds. So it's pretty exciting. Tundra be damned, that's our main result. Uh, you can see the time series imagery here uh, from 1950 and 1985. This is before the beavers arrive. And just, just take a look at those two images and see if you can detect very much change. You know, the permafrost might be a little bit warmer. Uh, the shrubs might be a little bit taller due to warming, but really the Arctic can be a very slowly changing place. Suddenly in 2002, you can see the beavers have arrived. They've started to build these dams, and you can see one of the ponds has, has grown in size, and thermal karst has formed. Thermal karst is thawing permafrost. It's karst topography that forms as a result of thermal erosion. So you see beavers flooding these areas, and then by 2012, you can see you have something completely different than what we started with in 1950 or 1985. Uh, the beavers basically formed, or beavers have formed a small wetland, and you can see a lot of evidence of permafrost degradation. Beavers are agents of disturbance. The Arctic ecosystem does not have a lot of disturbance. So here's this agent that has come from the boreal forest from outside of the environment and imposed its works and its construction upon the, the Arctic environment and, and changed it significantly. We don't know what's caused it. Uh, you know, warming over the last century has increased their shrub habitat in the tundra. It's also increased uh, river discharge in winter. So we know that there's more beaver habitat in the tundra than there was 100 years ago. That's probably contributing to this. But they're also recovering from over-trapping uh, during the 19th and early 20th centuries in Alaska. And the image at the bottom, which actually has ponds in both of them, you can't see it, but the image at the bottom is an example of how that, their forage and their habitat has increased in the Arctic over the last half century. So we think there are profound implications uh, that are resulting from beavers arriving to the tundra environment. You know, this is an environment that is underlain by permafrost, frozen ground, right? The ground is literally held together by, uh, because, it's, because it's frozen. And so when beavers arrive and they inundate these areas, immediately we get permafrost thaw and the formation of a lot of these permafrost features. Um, and you can see that here in this example from 2005, the entire perimeter around that lake, that's 100 meters by 400 meters, that's collapsed permafrost. And then 2011 and 2016, you can see indications of that, that thermokarst. So not surprisingly, when you, when you inundate these areas, uh, we see the permafrost thaw. The other thing is that we see, uh, that we're anticipating uh, is, is occurring is that because of the ponding, right, you take a shallow stream, you dam it, suddenly it's deeper, and you have warmer water in winter. And that's a pretty big deal, because these are temperature-limited ecosystems, right? So there's really not much biologic activity in these places in the winter. Very little unfrozen water, very cold water, and so this has the effect of increasing those water temperatures, and then it affects the entire stream downstream, because that warmer water is leaking out during the winter. And we think that that 
is leading to increased aquatic habitat during the winter. So these are like oases in the Arctic. You're dotting the landscape with these oases. And probably the best analogy that I can think of is imagine this cold, continuous permafrost environment where you're dotting the landscape with scores of groundwater springs that are leaking out these warmer temperatures, these places of enhanced biological activity, uh, possibly opening doors for uh, new fish species, for example. So with that, I just want to put the title slide back up there. Uh, ben Jones and I will be around to answer questions. And if you want more detail, uh, please come to our poster uh, tomorrow and say hello. Thanks for your attention. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Laura Pru here is going to talk about some of her research. Thank you. Let's see. <clears throat> All right, uh, I'm Laura Pru from the University of Washington, and I'm going to be talking to you about some emerging results from uh, my study that's focusing on doll sheep and how they're affected by global change in alpine ecosystems. Uh, this is part of um, NASA's Arctic and Boreal Vulnerability Experiment campaign. So in this project, we're using sheep as sentinels of climate change impacts in mountainous regions. Um, and why we're concerned about sheep is because th their populations have declined pretty strongly in the past two decades. Uh, Range-wide, they've declined 26%. Um, this is a sh mountain sheep that occurs uh, throughout the alpine areas of Alaska, northwestern Canada. Um, and uh, where the causes of these declines are unknown, but they basically are getting a double whammy because they occur in northern latitudes uh, where our, the Arctic is warming much faster than at lower latitudes. And they also occur at high elevations where those temperature um, differences can be even more exaggerated because uh, in northern latitudes you get a temperature inversion where you get warmer air at higher elevations. Um, and doll sheep may be good indicators of the general ecosystem health in alpine areas. They're active year-round, and they graze on the ground vegetation, so they need to be able to paw through the snow or have areas that are blown free of snow in order to forage. Um, and because they're such a culturally and economically valuable species, we have good data about their uh, populations going back to the 1930s. Uh, so because snow covers the, the ground for at least nine months out of the year throughout their range, uh, we hypothesize that changing snow properties are going to affect doll sheep and other alpine wildlife more so than other uh, climate factors such as direct effects of the climate warming. And we have, uh, in our preliminary analyses, found that changing snow conditions are affecting doll sheep in multiple ways. Uh, this sh map shows their uh, distribution. Um, and it shows the average last day of spring snow cover uh, from 2000 to 2015 uh, using data from NASA's um, MODIS satellite. Um, and so the, this shows kind of when the snow disappeared in the spring on average and uh, darker colors indicate later spring conditions. So we can see uh, that there's a lot of spatial variability in uh, when the, the landscape was snow free. And then when we look at the interannual variability over time, we see uh, quite a lot of variability um, from year to year, uh, but we don't really see any kind of increasing or decreasing trend over time in snow cover. Uh, but if you look at the swings from 2010 to 2015, um, it looks like those swings may be getting larger. So we looked at how these changes in snow cover are affecting sheep survival um, using um, 
1,570 surveys from throughout their range um, from 2000 to 2015. And we found a strong effect of uh, the spring snow cover, the snow off date on lamb survival. Uh, so this figure shows uh, on the x-axis as you uh, as the date when the landscape becomes snow free gets later and later, lamb survival declines quite a bit um, from about 36% uh, down to 20%. So range wide, we see a strong effect of snow cover on survival. Well, we're, under, we're interested in what kind of mechanisms might be driving those large scale effects. And so we're conducting field work in the Wrangell Mountains to look at how different snow properties like the depth of snow and the hardness of snow affect their movements uh, in the landscape and the energetics of moving through snow. Uh, so we're using instruments such as this magna probe uh, that I'm using where you, you can take uh, very accurate snow depth measurements um, and uh, collect a large amount of data rapidly and also digging snow pits uh, to measure the density of the snow. So here we're, we're measuring snow density uh, at, a, at a place where the sheep have walked through the snow. So we did this um, at places where there were fresh snow, uh, snow tracks uh, from the sheep in the snow and we'd measure how deep they, their uh, hooves uh, sank in the snow and relate that to how deep the snow was and how, how uh, dense it was. We identified this critical density in the snow that where uh, if the snow was harder, denser than 329 kilograms per cubic meter, then the sheep uh, wouldn't break through the snow and they could just walk easily along the top of it. Uh, whereas when the density was um, lighter than that, then they would punch through the, the, the snow and um, make for much harder traveling. So if any of you have traveled in the snow, you know what a huge difference it can make if you're punching through that crust or not. Okay, so I guess why, you know, why should we care about what's happening with dull sheep in these mountainous environments? Um, snow covers a third of the land, up to a third of the land surface, and um, so it's, uh, snow can have a very strong effect on a large portion of the globe. Um, and mountains are supply drinking water for over a billion people throughout the world. So what's happening with snow in the mountains is directly important for um, humans. And mountains also harbor really unique biodiversity. So by learning about how changing snow conditions are affecting doll sheep, uh, we can learn about what's going on in these mountainous ecosystems um, and how that might affect um, our societies. So I think the take home message here is that snow conditions are becoming increasingly variable and these changing snowscapes, uh, which are landscapes covered in snow, uh, are affecting the survival and energetics of these sheep, which are sentinels of change in mountain ecosystems. All right, and next up we have Scott LaPointe from Columbia University. Thanks, Laura. Uh, thanks, everyone, for de dedicating your time to sit here in the session. I'd like to introduce you a little bit to some of the work we've started um, looking at golden eagle migratory behaviors in response to Arctic warming. So the plot I'm about to show you, or, or why I'm interested in this at all, is what we think that golden eagles are varying in the response to climate change based on how old the eagles are. Um, so we're starting to find some age effects and whether they can be uh, responsive or not. So first I'm going to show you uh, basically two different uh, timings of migration, the spring migration versus the fall migration. So here on the x-axis, We've got a day of the year. Uh, along the y-axis, we have different years. So now we're just looking at the last seven years of data that I have access to. And so what you can see here in the dark green, what you should be able to see, what I hope you can see, is the average spring departure dates for this group of birds. 
And you can see that the width of these boxes indicates some sort of variation around the average. And then the lighter green is spring arrival times. So if you go vertically up and down through one color bar, you can see that both within years, things are variable and also they're variable between years. You can do the same thing for the fall migration periods on the right hand side in dark purple and lighter purple. But if we compare this to what the adult birds are doing, it looks, the picture is a little bit different, right? Um, so now we have a little bit less uh, variation between years, but within years it's much less. So the average departure date for an adult golden eagle in 2017 is much narrower than the sub-adults. So now a little bit like why this is important and how we know this. So I have not actually touched a golden eagle, um, but we work with a large group of wildlife biologists who have gone out for the last 20 plus years to capture golden eagles. Um, we've been really fortunate that they've shared their data with us. So this is part of one of NASA's above campaigns and uh, animals on the move projects. So we've got access to a lot of uh, location data, over 500,000 locations tagged on uh, over 80 different eagles over the last 25 years. And the map here on the right gives you some ideas to what these birds are doing on an annual basis. So there's more than 80 birds here, and it's too difficult to choose 80 different colors. So that blob of spaghetti, trust me, is a lot of migration. So why is this important? Well, we think um, that the adults appear to be a little bit less flexible in their timing year after year, right? They have this very narrow window when they just go up there. Um, Eagles are, like many animals, are triggered by a photo period cue as to when do you initiate a behavior. So every year in spring and fall, there's a change in the day length, and that stimulates a physiological response in the, in the eagles. Basically says, do some changes, it's time to migrate. A couple key things here, though, is that eagles cannot, uh, golden eagles cannot reproduce or initiate a nest until they're five years old. So they spend that first four years or so not actively contributing to their population. Then on average, they lay one to three eggs per nest, and those eggs each have about a 70% chance of survival. So a big nest is three eggs, and they're lucky to get two chicks to actually survive. If their nest should fail and all their chicks should die, most often, golden eagles do not try again. They have to wait until next year. So it seems like a rather fra fragile system. When we look at this in comparison to what we know is going on in the climate due to climate change, um, for example, this is just when spring has arrived, basically. When is this area snow free? We can see that these patterns are variable in space and time. So when we have a fragile system. We're trying to uh, investigate this with a very dynamic uh, a very dynamic ecosystem. So just one example of some of these uh, environment, environmental covariates that we've been looking at, we're basically just asking what did it look like when that eagle was there and at that time. So here again I've just split them between the adults and the sub-adults and here on the left this is just percent snow cover of where these birds are at that time and you can see when, when you compare the adults to the sub-adults there's some clear differences. For example the adults around day 100 are almost never in areas where there's very little snow. And you compare that to the sub-adults, they're not always avoiding snow, but sometimes they're in areas where there's snow. Now I can overlay this timing of migration. So now in the, in the light green is the adult versus, um, sorry, the light green is spring. On the left-hand side is the adults versus the fall migration. You can start to see some differences already in the sort of environmental conditions, in this case, snow cover that these two age classes are experiencing. Not quite sure what this means as far as how the birds are responding or what it means year after year, but those are some of the next steps. So to try to bring this home a little bit, we know from other people's work that species vary in their ability to, behave, uh, to respond behaviorally. Some animals are more flexible and can sort of adapt on the fly. Maybe they change some daily routine slightly. Uh, whereas other species are much more inflexible. For example, you know, animals who are, receive a photo period trigger, like a snowshoe hare, whose fur uh, coat color changes from white to spring based on photo period, not whether or not there's actually s still snow on the ground. So to, to wrap up here, we think that um, adults are triggered to migrate by this fixed cue, then their ability to adapt on the fly to this dynamic environment is probably limited. This could be pro problematic for this species as they're already uh, producing few offspring per year. 
particularly if climate change is bringing more frequent extreme weather events or changes in seasonality. Uh, we still have a lot more to do, including some modeling of environmental variables that could influence this, and ideally to try to extrapolate backwards and forwards in time to see whether these responses could or should change. I think with that, I'll introduce Darcy Gray. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. My name is Darcy Gray. I'm an undergraduate student at Tulane here in New Orleans. And this summer I did a 10 week long research project with NASA where I was using satellite data to look at how suitable one particular province of the Western Cape of South Africa is for a critically endangered species called the Cape vulture. So my preliminary results are that over the last 30 years, the suitability of this region for this bird has decreased by up to 85%. And this is when I considered uh, climate variables and land cover, and not when certain conservation measures were put into, into my models as variables. So this pilot study suggests that conservation measures such as feeding stations, are important to these species. And if they're modeled, um, the habitat suitability might look a little bit different. So these feeding stations are put out by conservation groups. And uh, studies have shown that they, that they impact the foraging behavior of certain vulture species and that they can, um, they can influence how, how vultures select their habitat. And with this species, what my study is suggesting is that potentially they're uh, supporting this species more than was previously believed. So um, for my methods, I used open source NASA satellite data. And so I used MODIS satellite and Landsat and the shuttle radar topography mission. And um, I put that into a modeling software with um, crowdsourced vulture sightings. So Scott's bird data was from tracking devices that were put on the birds, but mine were observed by people who then recorded their observations online. Um, so the reason that this is an important study is that the Cape vulture is a, is a keystone, eco, uh, keystone species in its ecosystem because it's a scavenger, right? So they, by, by eating the dead carrion, they continue an ecological cycle. And in other, in other locations where there's been loss of the scavenger in the ecosystem, it upsets this natural cycle. So um, my, and this, this area, the Western Cape, is particularly vulnerable to climate change because in the, that corner of Africa, there's two different ocean currents. And so climate change is certainly directing directly impacting this reason, and it's important to understand how that's influencing these critically endangered species. And yeah, so my exploratory research just shows the potential importance of these conservation actions like feeding stations in supporting species whose natural habitats are declining due to climate change. Okay, there we go, sorry. <laughs> All right, now we'll open it up to questions from reporters in the room. Okay. Seth Borenstein, the Associated Press. Um, as, I guess this is for Ken with the beavers. Uh, since the beaver, you know, the beavers are helping thaw permafrost, and I guess um, there's an Arctic report card out tomorrow on permafrost. Um, would you consider the beaver, since the beaver move you're saying is somewhat anthropogenic from climate change, would you then therefore say the results of the beaver spurring on more permafrost loss is anthropogenic because it's a one-to-one-to-one? You know, one -to -one -to -one, or would you say that's different than anthropogenic um, warming? And then for maybe you or any of the other uh, panelists, um, just Camille Parmesan is um, one of the scientists who are moving from, actually she moved from Texas to Britain, but now to France as part of um, President Macron's effort to 
pull climate scientists out of places like the US and UK because of political threats. Can either of you say how, since this is a field that she was one of the uh, first researchers are on, any of you can tell me how important Camille Parmesan is in the field of uh, climate change species uh, effects? Thanks for, thanks for the question. Uh, the question as to whether or not beavers are moving into the Arctic, being anthropogenic or not, is a little bit more, is a little difficult. We don't know, we know that their habitat's increasing in the Arctic. But beavers, you know, across the North American continent, the population has been recovering for the last century or more. And so, and we're less than a year into this project. It's been a really exciting project, but we don't know yet you know, exactly how much of that movement is due to, uh, you know, climate change increasing their habitat and how much of it is due. I guess it is anthropogenic in this, it is, they're both anthropogenic in the sense that, yeah, that's a good point. Um, they're both anthropogenic in the sense that one's a rebound from trapping and one's potentially driven by uh, climate change. Absolutely. But it is fair to say that's one of the, one of the factors, climate change. Yes. We just yeah. don't know if it's a bigger, Right, we don't know how to weigh, you know, the recovery from trapping versus increased habitat due to climate change. But I mean, the fact is, and you know, we've seen a lot of work on this in the last 15 years, you know, the increase in shrub habitat, which they need for forage and possibly to build dams, as well as the increase in the amount of unfrozen water underneath the ice in winter, those are both obvious things that beavers will need to survive in the tundra. So. Yeah, I, I would say it is anthropogenic. As to the second part of the question, you guys want to weigh in? I mean, I guess I'd say she's been very influential. I mean, she conducted pioneering work on phenology changes in wildlife populations, butterflies, and um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that. I'd say, yes, she's been influential. Harvey Lyford, Freelance. I'd like to follow up a little more with Ken on the beavers because this isn't anything I've ever heard of as being beaver habitat. I understand beavers to be creatures of the woods where they cut down trees to make their lodges and we have examples where I live in the DC area and we can see it. And I don't see them where there are just shrubs or or minor grasslands, and I'm wondering what is the impetus for them to be moving this far north into an area where none of that exists, or very little of it exists? It's a great question, and I'm afraid I don't have a very satisfying answer for it. Uh, you know, both of these factors, the population recovery, you know, and the increase in habitat could explain their movement into the tundra. Now, one way to answer that would be to ask, to answer the question of, did beavers exist in the Alaska, Alaskan tundra prior to the fur trade? But that's a difficult question to answer. I, you know, so, uh, it, it doesn't, you know, I've spent a lot of time in the Arctic in the winter, and it, it's just not a very friendly place most of the time. But I think, you know, the main thing that beavers have, they have to have a, short enough winter so that they can survive on the food that they cached, the shrubs that they cached the prior, the previous summer, uh, you know, they have to be able to survive on that. They don't have feet that are adapted to be on snow or ice, you know, they're adapted to be in the water or to be on land, you know, in the summer. And so my inkling is that, you know, things have improved a lot in the Arctic in the last century to century and a half in terms of, of habitat. And that, that's a big factor in, in what is you know, causing them to move, move into the tundra. But I don't know. And we hope to answer that in the next year or two. Thank you. I'm Ned Rosell, Alaska Science Forum, weekly newspaper column. Um, Laura, a question for you. Why do lambs have p 
or survival in late springs. And one for Darcy, I'm gonna slip into where the carcass is gone for the, um, for the Cape Vulture, thank you. Okay, so uh, there's a few reasons why they could, we're, we're not sure about why, uh, but there's a few different mechanisms. Um, first of all, it could be that when there's a really late spring, the females uh, are re very nutritionally stressed um, because when they, in order to successfully have a lamb, they need to be able to lactate, and that's about the most energetically expensive thing that a mammal does. Um, and so the female sheep, the ewes, need that lush new vegetation that emerges right after snowmelt. And so their timing of having their lambs is uh, generally to, it coincides with that period of good quality forage availability. Um, so that is probably a factor. Um, and also if they're having their lambs giving birth when there's a lot of snow on the ground and it's kind of still melting um, and not very easy to, to travel on, the lambs could be a lot more susceptible to predation. So most of the predation, the adults have very high survival. Um, lambs, as you saw, have very low survival. So typically less than 30% of them make it through their first year. And most of that predation happens in the first 30 days of their life. Golden eagles are uh, one of the main predators. Um, and also coyotes are a very important predator. Um, and so having that snow cover might um, make them more vulnerable to predation as well. So there could be a few different things going on. Right, it might be a lot harder if they're kind of floundering around in the snow. Um, it could be a lot easier for them to get caught. Uh, so to answer your question about the um, Cape vulture and their, their other prey, so traditionally they would be eating um, kudu and springbok and other kinds of large deer in this region, but a lot of those populations have plummeted because of hunting and they're losing food because they're, and they're losing habitat to urbanization and to their habitat being converted into farmland. So then the vultures in a big way have switched their, their food source to also dead farm animals and it's not really clear how much they depend on that either. So um, yeah, so that's why these feeding stations are supplementing the loss from, from those species. This reporter away from the microphone. Um, Victoria Gill, I'm from BBC News. Um, Scott, I just wanted to ask you about the, um, you were saying that it could be problematic that the adult birds are showing this lack of flexibility. Is there any kind of pattern in the population that you've seen either prior to this research that sort of triggered it? Is, has there been a, a decline that, that's kind of associated with perhaps this inflexibility when it comes to adapting to climate change and migrating? Um, I, I'm not aware of a lot. I know that um, population counts, uh, they seem rather stable aside from some slight declines. Um, so I, I don't know if the sort of climate change response or inflexibility would be the driver at the moment anyhow. Um, but I think they're relatively stable um, and declining a bit. Hi, I'm Liz Callagher from Environmental Research Web. I've got a question for Ken and a question for Scott. Um, so for Ken, could you give us an idea about how easy it is to see a beaver den from a satellite image in terms of the resolution? And then my question for Scott is, do you have any idea on how the young birds are deciding to move if they're not using photo period? dam itself or the pond? E either one. Um, that, that's a great question. Uh, so what's really powerful about the technique that uh, Ben Jones and some of, the, some of my other colleagues developed is that they're able to 
look at wetting and drying trends in Landsat imagery, which has fairly good spatial coverage, so a 30 meter, 30 meter pixel, and you, know, you get a number of images each year. And so they were able to look at places that had either wetted or dried, and then Ben was able to apply additional sort of geographic filters so that he wasn't uh, seeing places where a lake had drained unrelated to a beaver or formed unrelated, because they're studying formation and disappearance of lakes on a panarctic scale already. Okay, so the beaver work was kind of a natural pairing. Once you get to the high-res imagery, it's really easy to see, you know, the high-res imagery is one, one meter pixel or less. It's really easy to see the ponds, and it's, you can even see, you know, the individual dams. So it's, it's quite visible uh, in, the, in the imagery. And some of that, some of that high-res imagery goes back to the late 40s. So you end up with a, a pretty long record, even though the Landsat imagery we used was only 1999 to 2014. You can look back and ensure that, yeah, no, there were no beavers at those locations prior to that. So thanks. Yeah, um, good question. Uh, and you're giving me an opportunity to maybe clarify something that I didn't do a very good job of in my talk. Um, both the subadults and the adults have a photo period, photo period cue. Um, they both receive the same change in day length. They both can perceive it. The difference, though, being is that the adults don't have this impetus to go. Right? So the sub basically the photo period, what it does is it triggers a physiological response. And what that is, is basically in the adults, it triggers the gonads to swell and drop and, and other things going on. And, and basically, the subadults just don't have that yet. Right? I kind of look at photo period as sort of like opening the door, and these eagles can kind of look outside and see the weather. The adults just kind of go. They don't really care what the weather is, whereas subadults kind of hang out inside, sample the, the wind a little bit, see if the temperature is good, is there good thermaling, things like this. And I think that's why we see this more variability uh, around uh, the departure times, for example. Did I answer your question? Hi, this is, uh, I'm Josh Fishman from Scientific American, and this question is for all of you who have nice long time series on the species that you study. Have you noticed any reduction in the body size of the individual species members over time and any relationship to temperature change as has been reported in other Arctic species like butterflies and fish? We don't have record of body size for, for the beavers, so I'm going to defer to these guys. Yeah, and I guess likewise, they're, um, the only body size records we have for the doll sheep are from captures when our collaborators have radio collared them. Um, and that would be a really interesting thing to look at. They don't often catch it, because when they capture the sheep, they're often net gunning them from a helicopter, and it's stressful for the sheep, so they're trying to spend as little time as possible. So often they just put the collar on, take some body condition measurements, sort of on a scale of are they fat or are they skinny, um, and then let them go. Uh, but we do have really good records of the horn width, so uh, doll sheep are really neat in that they are like trees and they, they add a ring to their horn every year. So you can age a sheep pretty exactly without having to, with other, um, like with deer, animals in the deer family, you have to pull a tooth, shave the tooth and count the rings on a tooth because we put down a year of um, uh, enamel on our teeth every year as well. Um, so with sheep you can count the rings to see how old they are, you can also measure the width of those rings just like a tree and see when the growth was good or when it was poor. Um, and there's some research out of the Yukon, the Yukon Territory government has great records where uh, when anyone hunts a sheep in the Yukon, um, they have to get it, the, the horn kind of go to uh, the Yukon Territory government and uh, they measure the horn and they also measure the width of the individual rings, whereas in Alaska, in general, they just measure and make sure it, it was big enough to be 
legally harvested, which is usually full curl uh, horn. Um, and they found some uh, links between the width of those horns, so how good the growth was, and some of the decadal um, uh, weather oscillations, like the Pacific decadal oscillation. Um, so there might be some climate signals that are affecting the growth of the doll sheep. I think with the uh, golden eagles, like Laura, we could maybe get some of this data. Um, I'm not sure if golden eagles would be a great species to work with. Um, for this reason, they're long, long lived. So I think if you want to sample or actually see this change in a relatively short amount of time, 20, 30 years or something like this, you'd probably want a shorter lived species. Um, and I would probably look at skull size rather than body mass, which is probably pretty rarely measured in the field on species. All right, do we have any more questions from reporters in the room? Anything on the chat? All right, then that concludes our press conference and we'll reconvene at five o'clock with the media availability with the AGU leadership. Thanks guys.